All right, thank you. Welcome back to Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. What is your name? Who's your daddy? And I'm sorry if he's no longer with us. How am I to know? Also, none of my business. Coming to you uh, today from the Airwolf Studios in Hollywood, California. Um, look up their address online and then come by and stop by and say hello. I'm sure they'd love to see you, love to hear from you. They're the friendliest bunch. We're here on a Saturday, so there's not a lot of people. But, um, yeah, come on by anytime. In fact, if you have an idea for a podcast, they'd love to hear it. Um, I'm excited to have my guest. It's a return guest today. We've not uh, had him on the show since the very early days. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call today our ninth anniversary show. We've done really super high-level, highfalutin on stage at Largo uh, anniversary shows. Big ones. Today, we're just sitting back chilling on a Saturday with an old pal who's on a hit television show that uh, is hilarious and uh, intense at the same time. We're going to talk about it and so many other things. But first, uh, I'm going to invite you to write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I'm going to read a couple of your mail, your mailings today. They're called emails. I don't know if you're familiar with the electronic mail and how it works, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Um, I have just returned, you ask, from uh, New York City where the table read for episode one of season two, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, just went down a couple days ago. And folks, yeah, be excited. There was a lot of talk afterwards like, yeah, we didn't know what they were, how they were going to top themselves or what they were going to do because, uh, well, the first season was kind of magical and a lot of expectations going into season two. My friends, super relieved and happy to report expectations have been met and beyond. Just one episode, you know, first one, they could completely shit the bed there thereafter, but we're good on number one. Numero uno. What's happening in our world? Um, our president is going to meet with the president of North Korea. I'll talk to my guest about that today, too. It's very exciting. Um, because I feel like we have our own Kim Jong-un now. And, uh, you know, it's easy to make fun of somebody else's lunatic until you have one. And uh, I'm excited. I mean, it's a lot better than uh, sending the worm over there to sit with uh, Kim Jong-un, um, who's a huge movie fan, um, as was his father. And, uh, uh, you know what? I'm going to try to do a podcast live from over. Listen, I, I feel like Trump's going to open some doors for us, and I'm excited about it. And uh, I want to be the first podcast. <laughs> they want to. <laughs> what would they make of, of an explanation of a podcast? They don't have any of the equipment, the public, as in they, to even absorb a podcast or music or anything. Oh, exciting times. Um, all right, let's get to your mailings because you do have the internet. This is from uh, Town Moon Township, PA. I have been myself several times. It reads from Jarrett Covington. Sorry to be a pain. Uh, first of all, Jarrett, not a great way to start a, an email. Really isn't. With an apology. Whatever the fuck you're writing about, just lean into it. Don't don't uh, don't apologize. Not yet. Let me tell you when the time is. Sorry to be a pain, Jared Covington from Moon Township, PA writes. I just wrote you yesterday. Huh. So that's why you're apologizing because you wrote yesterday? He continues, just finished the Jamie Lee Curtis podcast. Holy crap, I love her even more. One of my one of the best interviews I have seen on the KPCS hands down. Just had to let you know now I will go back to fucking myself. Let's go, pens. Thanks, guys. Jared Covington. Moon Township. Our, my guest today went to uh, university uh, in Pittsburgh. We'll talk about that. This next one is from Greetings. My name is S Stephen Pie Man. He's, he's <laughs> Pie Man Tay. He's got parentheses and ebonics for me to figure out how to pronounce. I guess it's racist. Is it racist for me to say ebonics? No. Okay. Um, people keep asking me why I haven't seen Black Panther, the movie. I just tell them it's because I'm racist. Wow. Yeah. 
I think it's important to Wakanda come. Wakanda never, basically, for you. <laughs> Hashtag Wakanda never for Kevin Pollack. <laughs> Uh, it's only funny because it's not true. I'm a big fan of the show, Stephen Pimante writes. I started listening about two years. How would you pronounce that name? In lower at the bottom in parentheses. Pimante. 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 Pimantes. Pimantes. Yep. Um, don't pick the fries off the sandwich. That's sacrilegious. Never. It's phenomenal. I started listening about two years ago, and I think I've listened to every episode up to this week by now. I'm 38 years young. No no young person says years young. Yeah, that's trying to compliment yourself. <laughs> I'm a member of the SAG, and only from gigs I had as a child, but only from gigs I had as a child actor. It's time I get back on the horse or put my hat in the ring or cast my reel or throw my chips in the pot. Or maybe just audition for some roles as a regular old middle-aged guy with a tiny hint of talent. Is this uh, Pimante still? Uh-huh. You should just go by, if you do that, go, only go by Pimante, no first <laughs> no name. No first name. That's it. Yep. And uh, The way that he <laughs> spells it, too, so everyone right. can stress it correctly. <laughs> yeah. Um, lately, I've been listening intently to the KPCS, if for no other reason than hearing great words of wisdom regarding acting as a career and getting tips and quips and anecdotes about the current business as well as the entire Kevin Pollack experience. Misspelled Pollock, nice going. Kevin, do you have any advice for an average dude with some old lingering acting chops getting back into the game? I live in South Jersey. Well, that, we'd start there. <laughs> I'm ready to start taking day trips to New York for auditions. How do I make sure I'm not wasting my time up there? I'll stop calling it up there. I want to deliver the kind of auditions that earn me work. I want to deliver the kind of auditions. So I want to be able to audition well enough to be employed. Even small roles. Really? You're willing to take small ones? Here and there would be fine with me if it means I'm working as an actor. Thanks for all you guys are doing. I respect you all. Kevin, Sam, Sam spelled correctly with two M's. Jamie, misspelled. You guys are all the best. Pi Monte. Mante. Pi Mante. Pi Mante. Good luck. Yeah, drop Steven. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll talk about what it's like to be an actor that I, I was there for 15 years. So I can talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I emailed you back, Pimante. I, I respond every now, now and then, and I'm recalling that I emailed you back. So I feel like I gave you the straight, straight skinny in an email. Check it. Let's get to our guest. Damn it. Shall we? Um, I feel like I should have access to the interwebs in case we want to check on anything, um, that my guest is curious about. So I'm going to pull up the interwebs in case you want to know if there are any updates on uh, on Trump's plans. And also Barbara Streisand's clone dog. Yes. I feel like that, <laughs> that was covered pretty well. Um, oh, okay. Forget it. No, I mean, I feel like I saw something on SNL about it. and uh, But I, if you have any... I don't. Any I just, house cleaning. I, I used to have a Bichon. I think she, she cloned a Bichon, so... You have one of those? I used to have one used when to. I was a kid. Right. What was its name? Coco Chanel LeBlanc. <laughs> that was <laughs> That's the greatest dog my name. My mother named That's Coco the greatest Chanel, dog name Coco I've ever Chanel heard. Bijan means lap dog, by the way. So the guy with the billboards all over town for his perfume, Bijan? My mother was obsessed with Chanel. Uh-huh. So Coco Chanel LeBlanc. What's the LeBlanc part? White. The, the white. The white. <laughs> the <Yeah>. white. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. I'm just wondering it why it's... Why it's on there? Why it's on the dog's White name? Coco. Why, she likes she likes a latte. Mm. When it comes right down to it, your mom prefers a latte. Oh man! Um, let's chit chat about all things young Jason Antoon. If you know what, I'm going to put a pin in the young, and I'm going to go with the present day. Let's talk about present day. You're back from New Orleans. You're working on season two. Season two of as you called it on Instagram, Cross. And I'm just curious if that's racist. Well, craws, because I put a picture of myself with crawfish. Eating crawfish. So I said craws. I wasn't like, you know, this is the name of it in Japan. I wasn't saying that. Because it's actually called? Claws. With an L. With an L. Uh-huh. <laughs> because I was in front of crawfish. Right. Which, by the way, if you ever smelled crawfish, and you have to really be in the mood for crawfish, a crawfish broil. Yes. Boil. 
and your fingertips. You don't wear gloves while you're eating that. You're done. You're done the rest of the night. Worse than McDonald's. It's worse than McDonald's. It's worse than Doritos, Cheetos. It's just that. Just getting embedding in your fingertips and in the finger yeah. prints. Yes, in the fingerprints. And you have to you have to dig into those crawfish. So you, there's crawfish always on set. There's beignets on set. There's a, a beef cheeks. There's crackling. How do you not gain forty pounds? How do you not? I mean, the issue of for me is how do you not turn into Dom Dalloway's by episode four? I'm going to say James Spader's season two of Boston Legal. You could literally <laughs> see from episode one to the end of the yeah. season, he blew up like a poison and he's dog. He's not even a character actor. At least with character actors, it doesn't really matter right? if, <laughs> if you're eating or not. And no one cares if you and I get fat. No one cares. They're like, it doesn't matter. It just brings I like, the funny. I like my clothes to fit. Yeah. I've not looked at the number on a scale in a couple of years. Yeah. But Jamie calls me manorexic because I do, I get a little nutty about what I'm eating. But when I let myself go, look out, Larry. Yeah, it's true. I just was at the doctor's office and I said, don't tell me my weight. I don't want to know my weight. Yeah. Because it's, it's irrelevant. Do my clothes fit or are they That's tight? It. If I can put in the pants that I've been wearing, Mm -hmm. And you can all the, the pants don't lie. No, they don't. That's it. That's they our tell you. They, that's the new pants podcast. Don't lie. That's it. Welcome to the new podcast. It's called Pants Don't Lie. <laughs> Are you having trouble with Weight Watchers? Yep. Is, does Oprah piss you off that that the multi billionaire is doing commercials for Weight Watchers? I'll tell you what I do, Kevin. Please. Okay, so I my, I am not a workout person. I've joined gyms. It doesn't work for me. I've walked in New York City when I lived there. It really didn't do it for me. What did it for me in the first stage was Dance Dance Revolution, the video arcade game. I used to go to Port Authority before they redid it, and I used to do it with the 13 and 14-year-olds because they would teach me tricks. Let's slow down when yeah. you start it with— Not do it. Yeah, exactly. I used to perform— <laughs> perform. Call, call me by your name. Call me by your name. Um, uh let me ask you this. What year are we talking your Port Authority with the kids? This is 1998, 99, 2000, 2001. You graduated from the— I graduated from Carnegie in 94, and I moved to New York City in 94. Right. And I was there for 15 years. So mm -hmm. in that span, when I got into Dance Dance Revolution, that was my workout. Yeah. And, and how, how, many, how long would you a session be? Well, it's difficult because it's exhausting if you're doing extreme or you're doing advanced um, levels. And are you taking breaks or are you just nonstop? You have to take breaks, yeah. You have to. Because the kids are doing them and they're better than you because they they're have no crushing body weight. You. They're I 13. have body weight all of a sudden. Yeah. I'm 30. And your you're, you're, you're metabolism is just starting to give you yeah. a little wake-up call. Yeah, and you know, the trick of that is because uh, it's Port Authority. It's an arcade by the bowling alley. It's a little bit different now, but this is before they redid the, the bowling alley and everything there. Is the the dance floor of Dance Dance Revolution the thing you're standing on? The four arrows, right? North, south, west, east. They would get dirty, and so you would slip and not get a good grip, even if you had Nike shoes or good uh, canvas shoes on or Vans or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the kids would teach me: you have to get wet napkins and you wet down. You clean the each each one. Learning from and the then kids. Then clean your feet so you don't have the dusty port authority. Sure. And then you get a really great grip. That's a big difference, right? So cut to fifteen years later. I have children now, and I hula hoop. I have a weighted hula hoop, and that's what gets down your waist. Right. That's what gets down your waist. That's how you can keep eating, kind of, and your pants can still fit. Right. You're and saying that a weighted does work. Hula a weighted hoop. hula hoop. And how how long are those sessions? That's hard. I've done an hour, and that's really really difficult to that's do. That's crazy. But if you could do five, if you do five minutes every day. Um, it, it, it does make a difference. You just binge a show or watch something on television. Wa do something. You can't just if you can't just stand there with not, nothing to do and just do it because then your mind goes a little bit crazy and your kid comes in the room and is like, "What are you doing? You're a 46 year old man. Why? What's happening? And why are you lying about your age to your kid? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm on <laughs> I'm on the elliptical uh, at least five days a week, and and if there's not a television show on in front of me, it can't happen. You can't. It it's cannot. Could happen. It cannot start. If the TV went out, there'd be no working out. That Absolutely, day. it doesn't. Yeah. It's like it's like the equivalent of if you didn't have a cell phone and you wait for your friend on a corner. Back in the day, you would just stand there, or smoke a cigarette or something. Now, if you don't do it, you look like a crazy person <laughs> standing there just looking. <laughs> if you're around. not on your phone, you if mean? you're not on your phone, just going like, oh, right? that person's cool. He's on his phone. He's on his phone. Like if you have a book, you're a totally different level. Yeah. No one brings a book to then go hang out with someone, right? Nope. You, you know, unless you're like, hey, I'm reading a. Hey, here's a question I'm for you. I'm reading the Knicks on my Kindle. I'm not actually <laughs> no. really on social media. I asked this recently on the show, but I'll ask you: How did we get a hold of each other 
when we were teenagers prior to cell phones? Because if once you leave your – first of all, guys can't spend that much time on the phone to make plans. It just starts to get uncomfortable after about a minute and a half. Right. So we would make cryptic plans. But if you went out and you showed up at a place and, and they weren't there or, or they'd already left or yeah. you were late, yeah. how did we ever catch – we seemed to. We seemed to somehow catch up with each other. But no one pulls into a pay phone and calls anyone because there's no place you're calling. No. How the fuck did we find each other? Yeah, it's changed everything. It's changed movies. Now that people have cell phones, you know, when they used to say, don't put in cell phones in a movie, it's a little bit of a cheat because you can call. You can do things, right? And you that, mean in the script? In the script, like in a movie. I mean, now it's fine because you just have to – it just it changes the way everything is. It changes yeah. exactly what you're talking no, about, all why, those little things. Why didn't this character text that character? Right. Because that script was written yeah. eight, eight years ago. I have a script where the guy has a cell phone, I'm like, and he's actually kind of time traveling. And you go, well, how does he <laughs> – how does his cell phone work back when there was no, no surveillance? Would it still work? Would you, you still get the apps on that? Can you still do that? Right, but there's, there's no lot. cell reception in right. the there's 1800s. Some, you can cheat. You can get a you can get away with something. There's some coincidences. You Tapping can get into away the with telegraph. A uh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> but the waiting thing. You're right. Like I mean, it really How does. How the fuck? It's true. How do you? Like my kid, who's six now, and we used to live. We used to live across the street from his best friend, um, uh, and they would just know because they would hear. They would hear them outside, and then they would run outside and see him. Sure. That's a different thing than like Kevin. Meet me at. Um, you know, meet me at Santa Monica Pier at 12. Right. You know, like where? Am I specifically telling you where? And then if you're not there, do I just still wait around or do I just leave if you don't show up? Right. I mean— Also, there was something uncool when I was going out 15, 16, to even ask anybody, uh, what, what, what are you guys doing tonight? You know, you couldn't even, you couldn't even be that uncool. So if you didn't have specific plans with somebody— I guess we would run into someone at a gas station. They go, and you going to McRiddle's uh, yeah. party? Well, yeah, what, I am. Where is that again? Uh, Steve, you got the address? And the guy in the back seat would get you the address, and then you'd know how somehow oh to God. catch up with each other. Do you remember when you had little address books? Of course. Imagine I would just— the guy, let's do the, Someone's got to do the biography of the guy who invented the address book. All the little books, and you put the person's name, and you have this great list. You mean when his world blew up? When his world blew up, he's like, that's it, guys. <laughs> it's all over. And the family's like, Can how I, do we make money? No, I mean, I—in fact, in show business, when you first started— Having any sort of traction, you had to have a, a almost a leather bound appointment book oh my God. to to fit in yeah. to be part of yeah. the. Uh, oh, he's he he's he's making it. He's he's got an appointment book. He's got to keep down appointments. Did you have a big one, or did you I ever just break little, it down to a small little? Different sizes. I went with. So I started with a bigger one. And did you have cross that showed like you the whole week at a time? Week at a glance. Pencil or pen? Week at a glance. Week at a glance. Do you remember amazing. that? Week at a glance. Oh man. Fuck. Appointment, appointment. Right. Yeah. Doctor. And you would you would write shit in like Call it was mom. a diary because oh. there's nothing really going on. Oh, man. You used to go to Barnes & Noble's. <laughs> My phone looks like like that now, by the Still? way. Still? I, well, I keep the calendar. Oh, you do the like calendar. Like a maniac because I, I'm I'm so old I can't remember shit. And it shit. gives you alerts. So I put everything in the calendar. My calendar now looks like the week at a, at a glance with just br br bring the cat upstairs. You'll see that. Yeah, but as soon as you trade into it for a new phone, what happens to all that stuff? Well, the, it all gets downloaded. But like in 10, 20 years, downloaded on your computer. when you find your old address book that has all of your pencil I markings, kept them for a long time. It's going to be cool to have that. It's yeah. like a photo album. Oh, beyond. Now, where does all that go? You don't have memories. They're just electronic memories. Eventually, we're all just going to turn into like electronic people. Well, what do you mean by that? Like robots. Like eventually, I think- what, Robots what, or robots? What's robots? <laughs> well, robots are- you know, like from the 50s. I think triblings, no. <laughs> um, we're all going to be triblings. Just drink water. I think people are going to... What if, whose, life, whose lifetime is in this In a happening? long time from now, empathy will probably be gone. Right. And so, but, so which will, uh, if, if, if all empathy is gone, then that's uh, probably good. Really? I'm, I'm saying we need more empathy now, but if empathy is gone. Completely. And I think it all starts with the address book. <laughs> it's the over, it was over the address book. Once we got these things in our hand. Yeah, these, he's, he's pointing to his, 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 our his, cell phones. His giant, Anything social media, computer iPhone. where we lock into that, that is the end of the beginning of the end. Yeah. I thought the beginning of the end was when I went into a public bathroom in the stall 
in the men's room. I have to pee in the stall because I have pee anxiety. I can't go to the trough. Yeah, like, I do too. Line. I'm, I'm, um, Someone's so, going to glance at it. So I went in. It's not that for me. I don't want someone behind me. <laughs> oh, at the airports? I have to wait for a stall at the airport because everyone, everyone gets off the plane. They go to that first bathroom. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm like, nope, not going to go. I got to get a stall and lock like I'm taking a dump. Because I can't deal with the pressure. Worse. So I go in the stall. This happened like 15 years ago at a restaurant, public place. And the seat is down in the stall. Mm. And there's pee on the seat. Oh, fuck. And I thought, that's it. That's oh. that's the end of civilization because P on the seat is, in in all caps, fuck the next guy. <laughs> fuck the next guy. I don't have to worry about this. I'm just going to pee because I got to pee. Now, there's a whole generation and a second generation that are being raised on fuck the next guy. I went to Disneyland. Young oh. father, maybe 27, with his five-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. I go to the stall to pee. The two of them are in there. They, the door opens up. And, the, and I hear the father before the door opens up as they're finishing. The father says, okay, you're good, buddy. Is that it? Okay, we're good. Let's go. It opens the door. They come out. The seat's down. It's, there's pee mm -hmm. on the seat. And I thought, that fucking 27-year-old father just yeah. taught his four-year-old son it's okay to pee on the yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? Well, we get this every morning. My tr I try to teach my kid who's six, yep. lift the seat up because mommy, mommy women pee with the seat down, and they're going to sit in your pee. And or he if we says, have to take a number two. He's like, fuck okay. the next guy. But kind of with it, he doesn't say because you know he's he knows that word, but he he you know he, we don't want him to say that word. But basically, the 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 tone of his voice is fuck the next guy. It's courtesy, absolutely. It's um, uh, all, all these things. The empathy you're concerned about. Um, if we're not looking out for each other, then it all goes to the shitter. Absolutely, right? That's empathy. Yeah, that's an aspect of empathy, right? And and like when you go, it's it's like when you go to the comments section. If you look at the Donald Trump tweets and you just scroll down and you see what humanity is like, his comments. It's like half of snowflake liberals who are you know giddy about it and like trying to show him that he's a moron, mm -hmm. and then and then some of his supporters coming and the who defenders are, who are the defenders and yeah. everybody, everyone is. A moron. Everyone, it's just Both sides. how do you, you can't have empathy. It's very difficult to have any to show real empathy on the Twitters, right? On the Instagram and anything, right? Like, like you can't like. There's no emoji. That's a, a tone over text. It's tone a over problem. text. It's a. It's a. You know. Yeah. My wife says you leave. You have to leave like the way I text Ellipsy. someone is like you have to leave ellipses and a bunch of emojis to say like. Hey, we're still. Are you gonna be there at eight? Are you late? <laughs> yeah, no one you know, knows your voice is going fire. up. Like that. <laughs> you know, you got to put all the emojis to be like, I still love you. Light I'm saying this in a light way. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's you know. So well, that's the app we have to create to, to make. The I also came up with another app. Okay, is is uh, uh, the the sound of water. So if you have uh, if you're shy when you pee, you just put on your sound of water. Instead of if you're not near a faucet, sometimes you. If have I to, may, there's a already a recording app. Oh, so you could just record water in your home and then play that. Sure, but how about a cool app that's okay. free with ads? <laughs> <laughs> it just cuts into the water, and you're like, I can't do it. This ad keeps coming up. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible apps podcast. Um, let's talk all things New Orleans. Oh yes, I love the town. For those people who haven't been there, give them a a starter kit introduction. What? Uh, first of all, how's the cold brew? This cold What would brew, happen if you had another one? Oh, my God. This cold brew at Earwolf is like probably one of the best and smoothest cold brews. Right? I can't remember the name. What is the name, Sam? Sam allowed to talk? Yeah, of course he is. He, he refuses to. Let me find out. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's going to find out. All right. Um, it's un un incredible. And I'm a cold brew kind of guy. Do you keep Stumptown, some in the refrigerator? I, I, yeah, I do. Stumptown's I do. great. I do. Stumptown, I've... I'll like if whatever's on sale at Whole Foods or wherever I'm going, I'll get those cans or I'll get those bottles. Mm -hmm. um, Do you still stop at Whole uh, shop at Whole Foods when you're not on a, a, a successful I television don't. show? Well, no, because the uh, I am I live I have a place in New Orleans that is two blocks away from the Whole Foods in Uptown. Wow. It's the only place I shop. Right. So I I have to shop there um, because. You know, you can get deals and sales and whatever. I'm going to show you. Might as well treat yourself. It's not like I go all out and be like, I want to get the $20 toothpaste just because I can. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Right. But like for different things, like I'm a kombucha guy. I'm like a really into kombucha. For the uh, fermented yeah. alcohol? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love kombucha and I'm now obsessed with the sugar content of kombucha. How Cause... low can you go? 
Well, the best kombucha that I've found is Healthy Aid, and they have a really great, f- good flavor, and they have like a couple grams of sugar per serving. Really? Yeah, and a, a lot of the, and a lot of the other kombuchas. Does it say a couple, or does it say two? Or it'll say three? two or three, and then the whole bottle is two servings. So if you drink the whole bottle, you're getting, you know four to six grams. If you do GTs, which is one of the original kombuchas that have was that was mass marketed, which I still like, theirs is about 12 to 16 a, a, a can. And that makes a big difference. It's That's not added crazy. sugar. Some are added sugar. Anyways, loving this uh, earwolf Did we get kombucha. the name of the? Uh, yes. The name of the company is Joyride. That's coffee distribution. Joyride. Joyride. Fantastic. Are you on a Joyride right now? I am actually. I am. Would you like I, I really, some more? It's just like it was like a beer, like a le, like a Guinness, but without being so thick and and it came out of a and tap. it came out of a tap. When you get it, that's just fantastic. So the how smart are the Joyride people to come by and set up a tap for Earwolf Studios? Let's do it for Joyride, right? Uh, so talk to me about New Orleans. Oh man, so, give me the starter. Welcome people in. New or- look, if you have if you love food. If you love drinking, if you love music, it is a below sea level town that you can feel the voodoo magic of that town. Do you think saying it's a below sea level town? Yeah, absolutely. Totally changes everything. Below sea level. What does that mean? You're a little bit crazed. You're a little bit, it's it's a moist town, it's humidity. Equilibrium? It it, it absolutely affects your, I'm probably going to use that, not psyche, but like not equilibrium, but there's something. Being below sea level, it's like you know, being living way up in the mountains and and well, and that's high, altitude. Uh, uh, so you're uh, saying the altitude below sea level? I think it really does, and and it being a town like New Orleans where it's just drinking, eating, music, you know, you can really, really. Well, I think the pe- what people mostly know about New Orleans are those three things. What I'm looking for is let's go a little deeper. Okay, let's get beyond the music. Let's get beyond the drinking yeah. and the eating. I would say basically it's potholes. <laughs> they have a major pothole problem. Uh-huh. And you can talk to anybody. Every Uber and Lyft I get in, I talk to all those people who are from New Orleans about the potholes there mm-hmm. and about how and how they change in the streets. And, I'm, and I live in Uptown and, uh, you know, off of Magazine. And Magazine goes from all the way from um, Poydras or Canal uh, through the central, uh, the outskirts of the French Quarter, through the central business district, the CBD, and then all the way through the Garden District into Uptown to Audubon Park. And uh, the magazine is smooth all the way, but it used to not be. And then it gets crazy through Audubon Park. Like, I mean, brain skull rattling potholes. Like tire damaging. Yeah. And what they do is, and, 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 and this is, this is not what New Orleans is about, but a, a, a part of it is, it, you know, and, and a lot of the drivers have said, well, a lot of people don't want them to be fixed because it slows down cars from speeding. You know, you're going through uh, side streets and you're like, here comes a pothole that you're like diving down and it's going to break your axle. I was like, man, you might as well get into the suspension axle business in that town because those people are constantly changing it. Right. But it's a bit, it's an interesting thing because – that town still through Uptown. When you, I, I ride my bike through Uptown, for instance, all the way to the Garden District, like on a side street. I don't go magazine because you're tight in there. No one. I wear a helmet. When I ride my bike, I wear a helmet. And you go and you see that every other street is either a new, like a new up, a new house, or it's an old looking shack that's never been redid. redid. Redid? That nope. Sounds like bad. No, it redid. is bad. Yeah, redid is very re, re, bad. Refurnit, not refurnit. And you got hired. Renovated. You got hired to speak lines <laughs> for a living. Renovated, and 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 when those houses are renovated, then sometimes those street potholes are 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 covered and smoothed out. Right. But when you get in front of like you know, no, it's not so white anymore, and it's not so affluent, and they're like, fuck it, leave the potholes. When you say they are like. Fuck it. Well, like, I mean, I mean, probably the, the city planners, the city planners, or, or something. I'm assuming. I mean, that's you know, it's a long-standing tradition, isn't it, in New Orleans, where they're not looking after the less wealthy part of town. I mean, I, I mean, I think so. I mean, we saw the that. story of the Ninth <clears throat> Ward, certainly yeah, after we, Katrina. Yeah, was, absolutely after K- Katrina. Yeah. I mean, uh, have you been around there now, the Ninth Ward? Like, I've not. I've not. No. I mean, I I sort of know where what didn't get affected, and, and, and like Uptown didn't get affected that much where I'm at. But in certain areas, like you know, Parkway Diner up in the Bayou, and do Saint people John, do people talk about the possibility of another Katrina? 
Yeah, but I think it's, yeah. I mean, look, when it rains there, I mean, you're getting alerts on your, you know, like we get amber alerts. You're getting thunderstorm storm alerts. Like, below sea get, level. Get inside. You're below. <laughs> Find safety. I mean, I've gotten those alerts, you know. Yeah. And, and the rain, the, if, if the, the rain that comes down there within a five-minute span, if that came to Los Angeles, we'd all be like, oh, my God. <laughs> building an ark. That's it. No more water shortage. <laughs> we'd be building an ark. It's well, incredible how wet it gets over there. Yeah. First of all, the water shortage is not Los Angeles, a Los Angeles problem. I don't know if you have been hipped to the actual goings-on of the water crisis, it's not Los Angeles. The water crisis is, is central California, where, yeah, all, right. where all the vegetation is being grown. That's where the actual uh, issue is. I, I, I went to uh, fundraisers. The only reason I know this, I'm not a learned person in any way, shape, or form. Anyone who listens to the show certainly knows that. But this guy from MIT has this incredible program where he's going to central California. He's teaching people who grow, say, lettuce. If you grow strawberries— Here's how much more income you can have, and here's how much less water you'll use. And then, so the all you almond freaks, oh yeah, that's let's a, let's stop with the almonds, and, almond milk. I mean, the yeah. f- amount of water that they need to for one plant, yes, or tree is it a yeah. tree or a plant for almonds? I, I'm going to say, Jesus, how do we not know that? Let's Google it. <laughs> well, no, I know it's crazy when you drive up the five, all of those signs. Okay, so I'll get off that stump and ask Google it. You have two young kids, so when we were young. I said this on stage the other night. Remember when you have to – remember when you had to remember shit? Like you just had to keep a lot of things stored in your mind. And I feel like as you get older, you run out of RAM space. Oh, yeah. Right? So now because of Google, there seems to be less and less pressure to remember anything. So when you ask someone, hey, what was that place we went to, dot, 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 chances are they're going to go, I don't know. Fucking look it up. What am I? Yeah. Right? Let's that, get the encyclopedia. That's the next version of lack of empathy, by the oh, way. Oh, absolutely. I don't know. Fucking look it up. Yeah. And, and how do we even know How do you not true? say that to your six and four-year-old? I know. Well, yeah, because he's still learning how to write. Still learning how to spell things. Right. You know. It seems like Google could also help you learn how to spell. Yeah, but I like, you know, you just, you're like, you're not getting one of these devices until you're 13. I mean, that's Is that what they the do number in Silicon for you? Valley. Those guys in Silicon Valley, they know. The people that are creating these things in our hands, yes, they do not allow their kids until a certain age, about and you, twelve and thirteen. And you, and if they're doing it, then we should all be doing that because they're the ones writing the shit. And you know, a kid who's just sometimes you want to, it's a good babysitter. Sometimes you're like, okay, just sit there. I'm I had to bring you to this sugar fish. <laughs> sit there with here's the phone. Watch. I don't care. Play Angry Birds. Do do whatever. And that sometimes that's a good babysitter. And what? And how much research are, are you and the missus doing? Am I allowed to use her name? Shauna. Okay. Um, how much are you and Shauna researching what that time on Angry Birds and whatnot? Well, the pe- pediatricians always say, you know, like two, you know, they don't want you to, they don't want, they don't suggest that. But in terms of television watching, like the most two hours the whole day. Wow. And uh, I mean, sometimes could you, you do could, less than eight when you were a kid on a weekend? No, but I was like, I was like a kid who was like, "What's Benny Hill?" Yeah, what is or what, video what are those games? You what were are also- boobs? and video games and Land of the Lost, Sid and Marty Croft, all of those shows. But like, I was a video game kid. But like, you know, you shut it off. They make you shut it off. Yeah. Now it's like, all right, put on the Netflix. You know, but it's the kids are watching. Like my long, younger daughter likes to watch these toy videos. People P- unwrapping adults, and unwrapping opening toys. Like, here's the new. Um, Those like, people trolls. are millionaires. Millionaires, and they oh, there's one woman who's like, "Hello, Disney fans." She has an accent. There's a guy who's like, "We are going to open up these rare Pokemon cards, these hyper rare rainbow rares," and you're just like, "Wow, wow, H- millions of views, uh, hundreds of millions." I, I always wanted to do a parody where it's you do uh, adult adult objects that like opening up stupid a like a can stapler, of soup? how a stapler works. Yeah. Just dumb things with an accent. Do it. I want to. Like this dildo, how do you work this? <laughs> this is a new uh, uh, dildo from the treasure chest on a Santa Monica Boulevard. You know, you just do things like that and you just show it and like, like I don't know. It's just cra- <laughs> it's crazy what they get. But the pediatrician's like two hours at most a day. But let's get back to the phone. The phone is a different thing because you have it in your hand. and then you Is there research the available? Absolutely, research. Yeah, you can look at articles. You can go to so many things about um, 
The not warnings. how much time <clears throat> should your child, six year old? They probably should never touch a phone or an iPad. Right. They should probably never do that. Yeah. My kid knows how to swipe. Harper knows how to swipe. So he's on Tinder. She's on, on Tinder. Tinder. Harper's three, and my son Holden is six now. Yeah. And Harper like knows how to turn the. Vol- I mean, the, 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 all they have to do is see you do it once. Yep. And they're like, oh, they just have to memorize your. They're passcode. like those little uh, uh, alien. In a petri dish, yeah. who take over the ship? Who take over the ship? But I mean, it's funny because millennials now are pretty. I mean, are they gonna are they gonna be the adults in the room with, especially with the gun issues and like, you know, we haven't you seen go from kids to kids. These are kids who the kids that we saw in Parkland. They just changed the law in they Florida. They were the they were the internet kids. They just changed the law in Florida. Yeah, guns. There's so much stuff going on. I should know exactly which law they changed. I feel like, remember that uh, South Park episode where the internet goes out? Yes. And uh, um, had to reboot it. Stan, what's the dad we love? Stan. Stan Marsh. The other, uh, uh, the the dad. What's the dad's name? Everything happens to, oh, his father, Randy Marsh. Randy. Randy's my favorite character. Of course. Remember Randy was like, the internet's out. And he's like, (laughs) oh, because he had spraying because he can't masturbate. He had gum tissues everywhere. Gum (laughs) tissues everywhere. But I feel like the internet goes out, it will be a good thing. If it goes out, every once in a while, we should just shut it off. Well, they're, they're, you know, part of this wonderful administration is, is net neutrality. Uh, Yeah, that's. But no, you know, the guy who's in charge of uh, the FCC. Um, has his own agenda, and that agenda clearly is let's charge for faster bandwidth. In which case, your uh, your you know your cable bills and all those things, everything is changing. Like people like your household, you got off the, the cable teat. Yeah, we cut the cord. Cut the cord, but now, if the FCC's ruling stands and holds, and I assume it is, you're going to be charged for faster bandwidth. And the only way to enjoy even Netflix. You're going to be paying more. I know. It's insane. Your packages. I mean, it's just, it's just everything is about money in the world. Every single thing is about money. And, it, and it's never enough. It's never enough. And yeah. it buys politicians. It buys people. Yeah, someone, oh, I wish I could give them credit. Damn it. They said when um, the richest liberals on the planet, so your – your, I don't know, David Geffen's, your, 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 your billionaires who— Bill Gates, is he, is he a liberal? Sure. Um, when they say to a politician who's running, get me the number that the NRA is offering you to ba- back your support, and I'll give 20% more, and then don't take a penny from the NRA. The, I mean— When that happens— then yeah. we, we can stop having these ridiculous conversations on both sides of what the Second Amendment actually means. Oh, God. It's a, it's a never-ending— It is. It is. And by the way, uh, the, it doesn't matter where you stand on these positions. You're allowed to be as passionate as you feel about guns. And this country, you know, um, has had a longstanding tradition of what's it going to take on one side and— Leave us the fuck alone on the other. I would I would send you to YouTube Jim Jeffrey's routine on gun control as a stand up comedian is probably the most articulated and hilarious I've ever seen. It's brilliant. And and each thing ends with because you love your fucking guns. Yeah. It doesn't matter what we know to be true. It doesn't matter. It like, doesn't. And I, I have some family members that are, are responsible gun owners who yeah. grew up hunting and and um that th- you would never think that they uh you know, there's, there's, they, they don't, you know, th- th- obviously there's, there are people who are responsible gun owners. Yes. But that sometimes that responsibility is why do I need an AR-15? Why do I need a semi-automatic? Why do I need a bump stock? Why do I need that in my arsenal? Do you have a because bump stock when you're hunting this, deer? I would ask them. I didn't even know what a bump stock was until I realized, <laughs> you know, oh, wait, that guy had one in the Las Vegas shooting. Right. You know, um, I mean, I think. I mean, it's kind of. I've I've gone to I've shot guns and I've gone to gun ranges and it's cool. It's like it's a cool thing to like learn. It's a and bizarre to sensation. It's a, it's, a, it's a bizarre sensation. If it's new to you, it is yep. a bizarre sensation. And 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 I only had to do it through working on movies and the and the stunt coordinator, whoever would take you aside. 
I shoot an AK-47 in suspects, and he brought me over to a mound of dirt and had me literally shoot live rounds into yeah. this fucking dirt. And I'm like, aren't we going to use blanks in the movie? Why am I shooting live rounds? Eh, I figured you'd like to. You get the feel of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you probably do, and you're just like— It is a drug. You know, it is an instant sens- Tony Montana. sensation that is somehow in our DNA now that you fight to not give up. Yeah, and yeah. I, so I understand on one side uh, how human nature could go down that rabbit hole and 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 scream and uh, just as loudly. Um, did you see the town hall with the kids? Um, you mean with the with the Dana? Yeah, Dana Lausch. I don't know how to say her name. The douche. What's her name? Uh huh. From the D- NRA. Yeah, the D- D- Demi Moore. The Demi Moore of the NRA. Yes. Gym, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, it's incredible. It's a, it's an incredible. It's it's pretty incredible what's happening, like in a, in a bizarre. These kids are mind boggling, right? What they're able to accomplish. I mean, it's 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 one of the more inspiring stories of my lifetime. Yeah, it's in pretty incredible. They're pretty articulate. Jake Tapper was the uh, moderator, yeah, yeah. and I thought he but did a phenomenal job. But it's on CNN, so it's got to be yeah. fake. <laughs> Everything is, is that's fake exactly right. If it's not Fox News. Well, I'm also old enough to to remember when the broadcast or newscasters. Uh, just read the facts. That there was no opinions. There was no agenda. Here's what happened today. But now I feel like it doesn't matter if you're. Nope. You could be Jesus Christ, and you're on CNN. They go, "That's not Jesus Christ." That's He's right. On CNN. <laughs> Jesus Christ on Fox. Nope. Not Jesus Christ. <laughs> the white one. Yeah. Jesus Christ was Middle Eastern looking. Historically, would be Hasidic, he, Jewish, Middle yeah, Eastern. Yeah. Let's talk about Easter. Easter's coming up. Easter. Uh, I like to joke that. No matter what Bible you read, if it involves Jesus uh-huh. um, dying on the cross for for the, your sins, then you then in every Bible that covers that particular story, it was all God's plan, His Father, that He would die for their sins. One of you will betray me tonight. All of it was God's plan. So when I was at an Easter dinner once, as the only Jew there, and <laughs> everyone's giving me shit about it. The Jews killed Jesus, right? At the end of this, the nine-year-old at the table, listening, with the innocence of a nine-year-old, yes. says, ask me, do you think your people killed Christ? Just with the sweetness and curious. She, she wanted an answer. I felt obligated. So I said, well, you know, <laughs> we, we certainly sold him the lumber. Oh, man. So the truth of the matter is, it was God's plan. So uh, you're welcome. The Jews did their part. He, Jesus, was in fact born in Jewtown. As far as the eye could see, there were nothing but Jews. And I mean hundreds of miles. Nothing but Jews. Right, but it's also, it's not like Jews now. (laughs) The rabbis of the day were the politicians. They were the politicians. The Shylocks. And no. there was a, a oh, hippie in the woods in sandals and robes with people following him, and he was talking about peace and love. What would the government today do? What did the government do when the hippie spoke out? There was just one. So we, of course, call the Italians, the Romans. We ask them, you got to take this guy out, right? The, the, which one? Which one you talking about? The one in the fucking woods in the sandals. The guy, you'll see people following him. The, the guy at the front. He's got to go. <laughs> okay? Oh, man. So then how many days later does he – they open up the cave, they slide the stone, and he's not there? Time traveling. He has risen. He rose. Right. How many days was – was that an actual cave he was in? What, where was he? Yeah. Or a tomb. He was buried? Yeah, like a tomb, like a hobbit, like an, uh, up above ground with a circular stone. That That's what I, my visual is, and I don't know where that visual came like from. Bilbo Baggins. Could it have come from the Bible movies. that they rolled this stone door? You needed a multiple people to, to, to do it, so how could, how could that have happened if he was by himself? Right. Did someone come in and steal the body? There's that theory. Mm-hmm. No, he wasn't there. He wasn't there because it was all God's plan. And, yeah. And uh, I think— You grew up— I grew up Catholic, being taught like Christian, this. and then Bible. I went to Bible study and Bible highlighting Bibles. <laughs> and I went to Christian camp where every night you would talk. Badly read, about the Jews. Right? And I remember one question that our camp counselor asked us kids. And I was probably 13 here in California. 
what would what would God say to you when you before you entered the kingdom of heaven? What, what what would he? What do you think he would say to you? Would he let you in? And we had this whole long discussion. Hmm. And I said I would hope he would. No matter no matter what I did, I think I think no matter whether I was Christian or I believed in anything. You said he, this as what age? I was twelve. I didn't say it as articulate as I'm saying it to you now. But a version. <laughs> but I basically said, isn't it just about being cool? About a human being? being and that cool. started a whole thing. And he's like, what do you mean cool? I said, well, like... Be good to each other, cool? Yeah, like, do you open the door for people? Are you are you doing basic human kindness, I guess empathy again, to your fellow human beings? I mean, look, sometimes I drive down the 101 and I'm yell screaming at someone who cuts me off or whatever, right? But what am I doing no matter what? I, how do I... Like, if I run into someone... Are you saying hi? Are you being nice? Are you do unto it's others? Action. It's the action. It's not the words, and that's all it comes down to is action. Do unto others. Do unto others, and that, that is to me the most is... Christ-like. Whether you're right. whether you're a Christian or an atheist, you still have. That's what I learned from that. I mean, I don't practice anymore, and I don't bring up my kids in any kind of form of religion. It's just more about a kindness. That's yeah. all it comes down to. You're not going to die with your, you know, Lamborghini yeah. or your you know, MGBGT British car, which I had in high school. You're not going to, it doesn't matter. Which one? I, I had, had the Austin Healey Sprite, the little tiny one. Yeah, I had an MGBGT, MGB, 1969 MG. Is that the little tiny one? Yeah, but not the convertible. I uh, almost die like a hundred times because I forget to put the brake fluid in. <laughs> so, thank God. That I now be, say thank science. I don't say thank God anymore. That should be your <laughs> new podcast. I almost, for, I almost I forgot always to, forgot to yeah, put in the break. Yeah, that responsibility. But no, I think it comes— Do unto others. Do unto Honestly, others. Honestly, it that all comes really back. really should apply to everybody. Yeah. How do you want to be treated? How do you want to be then treated? Then just treat everybody else. Yeah, that way. And, 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 the, and that's difficult in the social media age because you, you want to just— you look at things and you see, you see someone saying something about Obama, for instance. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I don't understand how you could say something bad about Obama. You know, I mean, I'm sure people could, and they do, but to call him the worst president in history and it just just things like that, you, it's hard because you know you look at this and you have an opinion, but you can't have you can't boil it down to 120 characters. Sure, you can't have you can't be kind in 100. You can be kind in 120 characters, but it's it's very different. But be kind to others. It's all about action. It's not about your words when it comes down to it. What did you do in your lifetime at, to your fellow human beings? What did you do? Did you do more good than you did, like, bad? Right. Did you scream and yell at people? Did you scream and yell at your kids? Did you hit people? Were you abusive? Were you, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a, obviously, it's more complex. But as you say, kids, this nine-year-old asking that question, you know. Yeah. The kids, the, kids, the kids know the answers. I mean, as a kid, you know, I used to see those pictures of Jesus when I was a practicing. I was never really practicing. Because I was always making fun of Jesus at the same time when I was in Catholic school. Sure. That was my first big laugh, by the way. I went to St. Francis de Sales in Sherman Oaks, California, and the teacher left, and I got on my desk, and I splayed, and I laid on my back, and I splayed my arms and legs out. And I was like, who am I? Who am I? And, they were, and the kids were like, who, who? And I was like, I'm baby Jesus in the manger. And they were like, ah! And the teacher would come in and go, uh, to the office with you. <laughs> and I was like, but Jesus. Um, so... Uh huh. Uh, it was always that was my Jesus was always my f first form of, of of I can get laughs by making fun of Jesus, <laughs> and I think Jesus, if he were Jesus, uh -huh. he uh, he would appreciate it. He was like, that's a good invitation. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have an accent. I think Jesus has already come, and he's like, nope, fuck this. <laughs> no one will believe me. I've come. Yeah, he's already come and gone. Yeah. There's no way he's coming back. The return. If there was a second coming, if there was the sky opening up, we would we'd be like, who the? Yeah, what do we? Uh, they wouldn't believe it. He would be killed. He would say, there's a, uh, a leader of the largest, most dangerous country who, for the first time ever, a leader of said country is being sued by a porn star. So that I read as a, as a title. That's never happened before. Unbelievable. Well, no, no. Can't say that anymore either. Yeah, you're right. It's unbelievable. You can no longer yeah. say unbelievable when it comes to our current leader. And I wonder if he's – if he has alone thoughts that are as mischievous as they appear to be mm. or like most sociopaths, he's not self-aware. I think it's that. Yeah. I think you look at his businesses before. 
You look at him trying to build that golf course in Scotland. Look, talk to those people. But that's the Read one. Those are that's the one thousandth example. I know, but yeah. that's where the, those all those things. Every are, union are, suing him, you know, and then he becomes gets the most powerful job in the world, and everything he's doing is just to placate. I mean, most of what he's doing is placate the donors and all those people who want to get their agenda through. Sure. You know, I, I don't— Every I mean, time I hear an announcement like the tariff, the steel, and aluminum oh tariff, my God. the first thought is, who who is that benefiting? Who I can't And I went to school in Pittsburgh, as we know, we talk about this all the time, because Jamie's— Steel town. Jamie's from up there in the Berg. Mm -hmm. um, is, I can't, the, when I went to school, they had just closed the, all those steel mills. And this was uh, like, I think uh, a little bit before 94, uh, 90, when I went to school, I started in 1990. And they were just closing them and cleaning up the town. Imagine opening up those steel mills again, up there in the Trobe, get some rolling rock and stuff, you know? Um, I don't know. It's, I, 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 I feel like, you know, there's so many Bipartisan issues. Is it bipartisan? Yeah, bipartisan issues. And where are those? How do we not all get together as a country and say, yeah, the, the gun thing is this, and right. we should should don't we all care about the kids? Uh, why in the in the elephant hunting? Why are you now allowing people to bring elephant trophies back? No, now he just passed that. It's crazy. Right. But it's probably not crazy to certain people. Right. That's exactly right. It's helping. It's serving. Some master of some kind. Uh, I get the feeling your story of losing your vi virginity is a good one. Yeah. Well, let me be the judge. My story. Oh, oh, God. So that was. Well, nope. I mean, is it like tipped? If you put the tip in, is that your virginity? Yep. yep. Yeah, I was in. I think <laughs> I was. Well, I have one good story where I, I didn't quite get the tip in, but. I could, that's a funnier story. I okay. was in high school. I sure. went to Notre Dame High School here in Sherman Oaks. Uh -huh. uh, and uh -huh. I was at a party, and uh -huh. I had white pants on. Oh, buddy. And I had an Argyle sweater. Sure. And I took my brother's truck. So sexy. Yeah, sexy. Yeah. Argyle sweater, which was also white. And the Argyle sweater had, uh, you know, they have the diamonds. The Clearly, Argyle. this is not after Labor Day. So I had white pants. I had a white Argyle sweater on, and, and the design of it was gray and uh uh, fluorescent yellow was some of the Argyle colors, right? Okay. Remember how the sure. Argyle design is? I know how it works. And I had my brother's truck, and we went to a party <clears throat> in the valley somewhere. And I went with this girl, this blonde girl, because I liked blondes. I don't know. She's Southern California. And I remember we, we, were, we were like fool around, and I, I was like, I, I don't know. I think I had a condom or she had a condom. And Are you I, dating this girl? No, we were just we were went to a party and then I think we went back out to the truck to fool around. What, what point does it become clear to both of you that sex is in the air? I you're think, just making I think, out and right, stuff. Yeah, right. But also way before that, when you meet at school, you're like look at someone and you kind of know it's this or it's not that. You're both sluts. You're both up for it. Sometimes it's it's a look, right? Because you're at a I don't know. So I remember we went back to the to the truck to fool around and trying to hump hump dry it, hump it wasn't even dry because we were trying to have we were trying to have intercourse in a truck it's not like you have a big back seat you're just two seats so you try to get if she's in the passenger seat you try to get onto your knees are where her feet are if she's sitting in the passenger seat and you're trying to like it's not comfortable it's is not this, good i take it this is a parked truck it's a parked truck i'm not driving don't hump and drive um, <laughs> this is in the valley, by the way. I already mm -hmm. mentioned that. And I and remember where, she had stockings on. I tried to get the stockings down. That's that's also impossible. This truck is parked outside someone's party? Yeah, down the street. Okay. So we were like— uh, Follow like, me. Come here, come here, come here. And yeah, you get yeah. into the truck. Not uh, We're both totally into it. Your brother's truck. My brother's truck. Clearly and you're both into it. She had stockings. She had, try to get she had stockings and get the stockings down the media get in between the stockings— the stockings can't come all the way off because there's they, not enough room. There's not enough room, and I try to get my white pants down, uh -huh. and I have my argyle sweater on. So, so I try, you're not I'm in so stockings. excited. I try to put the condom on, and I just uh, before anything happens, <laughs> I I spl I uh, ejac ejaculate in the condom as you're putting it on. As I'm putting it on, and so then I and, and do you in fact say to her, "Oopsie." I don't remember. I feel like I, I. Uh, it might have been obvious. She, I, I might have been obvious to her, but I pretended that, like, you know what? Let's not do this. Because as I recall, and back I, then when you when you came, you would you would yell out something. I did. You would say something like, <laughs> "Jesus, no." Um, Here I go. There was some famous. I thing. did. Yeah. 
I'm making all this up. Oh, yeah. You want me to be like, and I used to say, and God, we trust. No. It was the only way to just just ejaculate by saying those so words. So she's getting her stockings down. She's excited as hell. Low, she doesn't know what's happening. You're know 16, 17? I didn't make any gestures that I was going to ejaculate. And I ejaculated in the condom. And she's like, she's like, are, we, are we going to do it? And I was like, I don't think we should do it. <laughs> And so that I, was your move. That was my move. So I was like, it doesn't matter. Forget it. And I, I was can't. like, what's not? And then I tried to get out of her thing and I somehow slipped the condom off. So she thinking that she wouldn't see it. And all the Juice. stuff went on my white pants. Sure it did. And she's like, let's go back to the party. And I was like, wait, I have, there's obvious stains on my white pants. For some reason, it's like wet on white, you can see. Uh-huh. They don't, they're not going to know. It turns gray. Like I dropped, I... It turns gray. So this was another one of my my ways of First perfor- of all, performing. First of all, I got to go back just to a moment. Yeah. A moment in time, which is you coming into the condom and her somehow not knowing after being hot and heavy, because if anyone's I, ever been in those moments, it is a, a train moving down the track. It's a train moving down the track, so yeah. And it leads to one place. And on the way there... For the guy to say, yeah. you know, I don't think we should do this, just doesn't happen. Well, I think I was make kissing her and like uh, kissing other. Like, Maybe we shouldn't do this. Yeah, you know what? Let's not. Let's not. Let's not. I, I'm going to save your virginity. I, I think I. I mean, I don't. She didn't say anything like, "Oh my god," but she's like, "All right, let's go. Let's fine. Let's fine. Let's go to the back to the party." So you you confess to her that there's wetness on your pants. I didn't confess. That. Oh, you said I'll catch up with it's you. It's dark in the truck, so I was like, she doesn't. I don't think she knew. So I took my argyle sweater off and I put it in front, wrapping like a, it around the like back. I was a chef, like on a on a line. No one's going to question chef. that. And I, the way I got away with it when we walked back in the party. Was uh, play a uh, look at me, look at me. I was like doing this whole thing with the sweater in front and I wrapped it around and I try. Oh, I'm a crazy I, man. I was a crazy person. That was the only way to be like to not. What did you have on top if, underneath the Argyle sweater? Just a t shirt? Yeah, like a t shirt. Uh-huh. Yeah. That'd be funny if I didn't. I was just like, <laughs> who's this hairy guy that's in high school? Because um, I did have a hairy chest. So I would, I somehow kept it on and then I, you know, it dried out eventually because I would go to the bathroom and just check and I was like, it's almost dry. It's mm-hmm. almost, I can put the sweater back. On over my shoulders in the way that, like you know, Oops. James Spader would wear in like those '80s movies. You yeah, know, you know, the arms over and then you wrapped. Second right? time James Spader. Crazy that we dressed like that. I feel like your that was a that I didn't actually have intercourse. No intercourse. But that was like the first. You know, I mean, if I, I may, you could not tell anyone you lost your virginity that night. I didn't. I'm sure you did. But that's a funnier story than me. Like when I was in college and I first sort of like, you know. So the tip goes in where when. Well, the tip kind of went in on the condom one that a story I just told you. Not really. I just like maybe like. You said a, when I was putting the condom on. It was a Reiki on. tip. Reiki tip. <laughs> it didn't really touch it. <laughs> no, I know. You put it on. I was up against her, so I, just, I put it on. And like she's sitting like this. It, it's better if I physically <laughs> did it for people that are listening. I, I, we, physically t- like got the show. Theater of it. the mind. I mean, so the other story in college was just I. <clears throat> Wait I a think, second. Back to the truck for a moment so, yeah. we, so we can fi- give them the visual. If you're facing forward and seated on the truck seat and she's straddling you. No, that's not what it was. So you're trying to put the condom on. I picture her seated next no, no, to she's you. She's sitting on the passenger seat like you would in a passenger seat. I get between her legs and then I have to bring – and I'm my knees are on the foot rests of where she was seating. So I'm facing – Foot rests in a truck? You know, where the, the feet The floor. Go. The floor. Foot floor. I don't know what you call that, <laughs> technically. The foot floor. It's the floor bed. Jesus. <laughs> so your knees are on the floor of the truck. Yes. And so then I had to take the things off, and now I have Stockings to stand, down. stand up, go over the between the area, because I can't bring it all the way down, because it would go just to her calves or her lower knees. Stockings. So all of that business, I was doing business down there, and so I was too excited that I was just like, hurry up, and I had to put the con- <laughs> like put the condom on as fast, because like, you know, at that age, you can have a four or five hour erection. But I, that's right. I brought us back to here because you were trying to make it clear, and you said, I was pressed up against her as I was putting the condom on. So oh, the tip technically almost did go in, and I became fascinated with how does that mathematically, how does that visual work? You're facing her, you're leaning into her. Yes, yeah, she's like, I'm kneeling. You're kneel kind of humping. Yes. 
And as you're doing all of that, your little 17-year-old hands are reaching down and trying to apply a condom. I applied the condom and like, so it was hitting like- Prophylactic. So she, yeah. So she would bring her knees up and I was trying to like, so it would like- Oh, the knees are up. See, I did not see because that. The, because I had to bring the things down. So that was the only way. And I'm inside like Now's strapped. a good time to break for the sponsor. Yes. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you end up in the who's scow? Did you ever end up uh, in any sort of lockup? Were you ever arrested for any reason? Absolutely not. Okay. And what was the moment for you when you said in a quiet, quiet, personal moment, holy shit, I'm officially in show business now? Even if it didn't happen then, if you were to look back, what would it have been? It was uh, I understudied the Steve Martin play off-Broadway called Le Picasso at the Le Pan Agile. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the first big thing because it ran like a year and I went on for multiple roles and um, that that was probably that because Steve was always around Steve Martin was always around at least in the very you know through um, uh, previews and dress rehearsals and opening night and to see watch him give notes and watch him and watch and that that was the that was probably the first big thing because I lived on the Upper West Side and it was a few blocks away because it was at the old Promenade Theater which is now a Sephora 76 and Broadway, where it was. Mm -hmm. They did a, that Hurley Burley there a long time ago. It was a great theater. Wow. And that, that was probably the first time. To, and, and I Holy was just shit, out of I'm school. in show business. You know, Gabriel Macht, who's the star of Suits, who is. How many of, seasons now for Suits? 78 seasons. I still can't get on the damn show. Still can't get on it. Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> Gabriel. Insanely successful. Insanely successful. Show. Gabriel and I went to Carnegie Mellon together. He was playing Elvis, the visitor, they called it, even though he was Elvis. And so I, I understudied him, and I understudied Tim Hopper, who played Picasso, who originally did it at Steppenwolf, and I understudied Peter Jacobson, who played Schmendeman, this character Schmendeman. And I went on for all of them all the time because they were all getting other jobs, and they'd go away for like a couple days. Mm -hmm. but, but to be in a show with Gabriel, was, that, that was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to uh, hell yes to uh, and, the, and then years and years later, he's on season 500 of Suits. <laughs> we, he and I did a motion picture together. I believe you were also in it. Oh, that's right. Middle, uh, middleman, you middleman, you jerk. Right, of course. We all did a film together. Middleman, how, great, how, really great film. How nice of you to remember. Directed by George Gallo. Uh huh. Yeah. R written and directed. By written George. and directed by George Gallo. Yeah. That's right. Duh. Premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Gabriel. Gabriel's. Yeah. Uh, who were your influences at this uh, prior to this when you were a teenager? Uh, you, you mentioned something about watching um, Benny Hill, but uh, it's interesting because I watched. I, 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 my father would not. I would watch Three's Company first, Benny Hill, and then I'd watch Three's Company, and I thought this is the funniest thing. This guy who who is this John Ritter guy was so funny to me. And How old are you? Uh, probably junior high. I was probably like twelve. Okay, and they would catch me watching, and they're like, "You can't watch this." Because I, I didn't under I I kind of understood the innuendo, the sex innuendo, the three motifs of comedy, which are food, money, and sex, right? And I didn't understand until later that oh, that's Three's Company. It was always like like Janet and someone are talking about a pan in the other room, and Jack is listening, but we only hear what they're saying, and Jack thinks they're talking. It's so big, she would say. And the guy's like, yeah, it's a little bit – it's, it's, it's thick. And I'm not sure it's going to fit. I'm not sure it's going to fit. And Jack would be like, oh, are you making faces? And I'd be like, oh, my God, I didn't know they were talking about a pan. I thought they were talking about his penis. <laughs> and that was really influenced me. And I was like, oh, my God. And John Ritter, was like, who's like an um, incredible modern-day clown. He was a phenom. He was a phenom. He was so funny and so likable at the same time. That was a big, uh, a big thing. And then and for, for me as, a, I guess, a comedian or a wacky side – and I and, and but it wasn't until my high school drama teacher would, took me to a John Cassavetes film festival. Oh boy! And I was like, "What's this?" Your high school? She took me to a Cassavetes film festival, and we watched Shadows, which was his first movie. Which class was she teaching? A drama. She drama. was my drama teacher. And Judy she said Weldon. to everyone, "Okay, I'm going to turn you on to this guy named John Cassavetes." Yeah, Judy Weldon, who was this great drama teacher at Notre Dame High School. Uh, and, and you all said, "Who's John Cassavetes?" Who's John Cassavetes? I understand, and I I remember he's married to Jenna Rollins, and I'm and I remember seeing I used to see Jenna Rollins at the Ralphs on Ventura uh, when I was a kid. She always had those big sunny '70s sunglasses. I didn't know at the time until later, but my mother would remind me, "Yeah, that was that's Jenna Rollins." Like, what later would you when I was do? Older. If tomorrow, 
the people at Ralph's, like Rafe Fines, mm-hmm. also spelled Ralph. I would love it. Decided you needed to start calling the store Rafe's. Let's go to Rafe's. Just incredible. I would think it would be hilarious. How? How? My Rafe's rewards card. You can't say that fast. Ralph's rewards card. Rafe's rewards card. You're like swallowing it. <laughs> but rawr, rawr. I love the moment in time. I, and, and clearly, this is the dumb American. I'm sure many British people spelled Ralph are pronounced. I saw Ralph Fines in Hamlet. Rafe. Rafe. Because he- Ralph, if I may, is about as pedestrian of a person's name. Yeah. Ralph. Ralph Mouth. Ralph Cramden. Ralph Cramden. I mean, that had to have been carefully selected. Ralph. But not with a British accent, you don't say Ray, Rafe. Are all Ralphs in Britain Rafes? I, that's my question. Please write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. We'd love to know if all spelled Ralphs are pronounced Rafe or if it's just the fabulous Rafe Fines. Um, so I interrupted you. Your your teacher took you to John Cassavetti's film. You saw his very first one. I saw Shadows, which is a black and white, which at the end it says this whole film was improvised. And I was like, what is happening? And had you learned improv yet in, in drama school, uh, drama class? <laughs> Not officially yet. I right. did a Carnegie Mellon when you, Later. you got that book, Impro. Right. And you're like, oh, you don't bring a gun into a scene and you don't say no. I mean, that was the first <laughs> rules. Because I always brought a gun into a scene because it was so easy. Of course. You just shoot everyone. Everyone on the, everyone on the ground. Right. They're like, down, down, down. You're like, Jason, it's funny, but you just <laughs> killed the scene. Stop with the gun. Uh, but yeah, so when I saw John Cass, I just was blown away by it. I, sure. And I, then I really got into his films. And ironically, I never had that kind of career. I never had the like, let's get Jason Antoon for this great role in... Because Cassavetes was like that, uh, to me, was the, um, obviously he was a lot of people's mentors. You know, mm. he was, I mean, w- uh, the, 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 the biggest, the, the most interesting connection, which I didn't find out later until I did my first movie, which was Minority Report, with Tom Cruise and Steven Spielberg. And I had a conversation with Spielberg. And I mentioned something about John Cassavetes to Tom Cruise. This is so weird. And Tom's, Tom was so nice. And Cass- Spielberg said, are you talking about, John Cassavetes, I said, yeah. And he's like, did I ever tell you, uh, I, you know, that was my first job. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? I could never make that connection. And he said, I was an intern on Shadows. And I was like, wait, what? How? Tell me the story. He tells me this whole story. When he was a kid growing up, I can't remember if it was Glendale or somewhere in the valley. Let's say Tarzan. He would, he's told me he would break into, not break into, but sneak onto the universal lot. Right. And he would, uh, he'd find his way through to studios. And he, one time he found his way into a studio and he'd sit in the shadows of the back of the studio where John Cassavetes was directing William Shatner in, I can't remember the name of the TV show that Shatner was on. And he said that Cassavetes would turn around and see this kid in the shadows and he would come up to him between takes and say, what are you doing here? And little Spielberg, little Spielberg, young Spielberg would say, uh, you know, I want to be in the business and I think I want to direct. And, and Cassavetes like, all right, stay here and just watch. So he would go back and he would direct more William Shatner and he would, between takes, go to Spielberg and say, what do you think of that take? And what do you think of that? Shut up. And, and then he said, eventually, eventually Shatner would see this and heard this and was like, why do you keep talking to that kid back there? And he would storm <laughs> off. And I wrote this because I wrote this down in a journal that I took because I was like, I got to write a journal for the couple days and I'm on this movie because it's Spielberg and sure. Tom Cruise. And I re- distinctively remember that story. And to have the connection that Spielberg to Cassavetes is a big bridge. That's a, you know, I mean, Scorsese, yes. Because Scorsese, Cassavetes was like, do mean streets to Scorsese. Yeah. He was that, I can see that connection. The Spielberg connection, I don't see, but it's an awesome connection. Yeah. Because where does Spielberg, once he interns on a Cassavetes movies, he goes to what? I mean, I know he did some stuff before Jaws, but. Well, no, he did television first. In fact, an episode, he directed uh, Jack Cassidy in a very famous episode of Columbo. Oh, wow. When he was, I think, 19. Wow. On the Universal lot. So I wonder. It's so crazy. If that beca- that, and I know that's where Amblin always was. Maybe it still is. How, I mean, isn't that maybe that amazing? Like they built Amblin in the place that he snuck on the lot. Like, yeah. how did he get on the lot? Right. So it was a really cool story. And, and so that was like a big, it, for me, it was a, 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 a great bookend to yeah. me getting into Cassavetes as a kid. Never probably ever going to be in a Cassavetes kind of 
No one's going to be like, let's. I'm going to do a. I'm going to do an independent movie. Let's get Jason. Right. You know, I'm. You know, my career is totally different than that. But that's. I love that stuff. I. You know, I love. And so to see that connection in for me when I worked with Spielberg, it, it was like a nice little bookend mm -hmm. in that moment of my career. And now you're on Claws, and we haven't talked about it at all, and we're running out of time. So let's talk everything Claws. It's a show that airs on the network known as TNT. TNT. Mm -hmm. um, if you have On Demand, I'm sure every episode from season one is available. Yeah, it should be on Amazon Prime soon for season one, which came out last year. Mm -hmm. And we shot – so Claws is created by Elliot Lawrence, this little genius of a man who's awesome. And when you say little, you mean like four foot three, kind of little? I don't know why I call him little. I don't know. I, don't know. I just put Lil. Well. Is he taller than you? No, he's not. So. Okay. But he's not like. I think you look down at your boss, is what I'm saying. No. Is he still running the show? He's not the showrunner, but he's there. He's, he created it. He created the show, and the showrunners. He's back in LA comfortably writing episodes from his. Uh, no, no, he stays. He, he, lives, a f he lives by me and by the Whole Foods. Oh, okay. But he stays there in New Orleans. The okay. showrunner, Janine Sherman Barrow, sh goes back and forth to the writer's room and back and forth. Okay. And Rashida Jones and William Mc Will McCormick are the exec producers that got. So the show originally, four years ago, was a half hour show at HBO. You know, HBO takes forever to do stuff, and they they did. It was a bookshelf for a while, and then when they were not going to do it, bookshelf means the script sat on the <clears> shelf. <throat> yeah, I don't know okay. why no one calls it bookshelf. <laughs> it was shelved. Uh, HBO probably has a lot of commodities, and they don't ever do them. No one calls it commodities, but I thought I would <laughs> properties. <laughs> properties. So, uh, but TN, when TNT got when Kevin Riley went to TNT and Sarah Aubrey, Sarah Aubrey, they were like, "What about making it an hour show?" So they turned it into an hour show, and then they picked up the series, and I got on the show, I, uh, which as, as Dr. Ken Brickman, the show is about five women, very diverse women, uh, Nisi Nash, Car Carrie Preston, Judy Reyes, Karuchi Tran, and Jen Line, and they work at a nail salon in Florida. Uh, what part of Florida? Uh, Sarasota, sure. Manatee County. Sure. And they launder money through their nail salon for the Dixie Mafia that's run by Dean Norris of Breaking Bad. And uh, they launder through their, the pill clinics that are being run by the Dixie Mafia. And the one main pill clinic in the show is called Suncoast Rejuvenation. And I am the doctor that runs the pill clinic. I am For a, people who don't know, a pill clinic is what? Uh, like, you know, you're getting your Oxycontin, Oxycodone, your, your pill billies are going there. Pill billies. And um, the people that are like, you know, so the this opioid is a, epidemic. This is, is a corrupt pharmacy? It's corrupt, but I have a legal license and we- Doctor's legally, office. Yes. It's a doctor's office. You but it's all in, owned- Doc, my- Something hurts. Are like, you treating regular, your character treating regular patients have nothing to do with the Dixie mob? So it has a clean front? It's shady. But it's, it's, but it's clean. No one's busting us yet. No one busted us. They try to try to look into it. Uh huh. But you know, all the true stories based on those doctors who do that. I mean, they eventually get busted because you're just here's 150 count of oxycotton. Are there any law enforcement agent uh, com, uh, characters? On yes, the show? they are. Yeah, and they're shady as well. Uh huh. Right. So that's the premise of the show. Right. And uh, there's musical numbers. There's dancing numbers out of nowhere. It's a pretty wacky tone. But not wacky. It also gets dark. So it's a dramedy. Basically, it's a dramedy. Right. And you're dealing with um, instantly successful. I want to point. Yeah, out. they did. It was very successful. It was the TNT's new regime was like Animal Kingdom, Good Behavior, and then our show came. Right. And now they have the Alienist. Yeah. And uh, so they're you know everyone's competing with over Netflix 450 and scripted television it's programs unbelievable. to watch. It's a boon yeah. for writers and actors and directors and crews and whatnot. But for the viewer, for the audience, it's overwhelming. How do you break through? So when a show does, like Claws, or if I may, mar Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, <clears throat> Hello. when you do break through, I find it shocking. I find it to be such an unbelievable relief that we find ourselves gainfully employed uh, in a time when it's easier to get a job and nearly impossible to keep a job because nothing lasts because there are too many fucking shows. Absolutely. Right? It's true. My wife and I, we turn on Netflix, we turn on Hulu, and we're like, another new show? I don't understand. There's so many shows, fourth season of this, and you're like, never heard of it. Uh, people not, people did not, they kind of heard of Claws. If they go like, what show are you on again? I said, Claws. They're like, is that 
like like claws as in like the law office? I said, no, like claws as in fingernails, women's nails at a man at a nail salon. Oh yeah, I know what that show is. Right. I haven't watched it yet. I mean, no one watches anything. <laughs> no one in the business of our friends watch anything unless you're on Game of Thrones or right. Stranger Things or yeah. Walking Dead. It's how I knew that Maisel was in oh I, I dare say in the zeitgeist because I was getting texts and emails from jaded show business people saying, oh. I fucking love your show. I yeah. can't believe like people I haven't heard That's from how you really in know. forever. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. That is the litmus. Absolutely. And at, at this point, I don't, I care, but I don't care because just to have a job nowadays is a yeah. miracle. Yeah. But to have a job, I mean, you won, you guys won the Golden Globe and the, the fantastic woman, the Rachel. Show, she won. I don't know how to say her last name. Best thing. actress, Brosnahan. Brosnahan is, is, a, so is phenomenal. Yeah. And that was a like a perfect, when you get a, that's the, I mean, you get a yeah. perfect role for that girl. But but what's weird is, and I'm, tell me what your experience like with your show. When you hear from someone who, you think, well, that can't be the demographic. Like Jamie's niece, who you know, Jaden Dobro. Jaden um, Dobro. Who's 20 Birthday, tomorrow. Yeah, I, was, no, I saw that on Facebook. Um, uh, 20. I know, Jesus. it's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm 100. Um, her and her 19-year-old friends are obsessed with this show, Maisel, that takes place in 1958, Upper West Side Jews. And I'm thinking, how, 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 what part of this is – well, there's a woman at the center, and she is self-empowering, and her wardrobe is phenomenal, and the music is great. It, it, and, it, and it's a woman who created Gilmore Girls, and the conversations and the dialogue – it's all encompassing. But to me, again, that never would have crossed my mind. You know who we're going to get. Yeah. We're going to get the 19-year-olds. That's am- that, What are you talking about? That's like, <laughs> that's unheard of. And then my mother, who's 86, says, I love the show. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's a big surprise. Yeah. So and Claws is one of those things where you tap into a demographic. We tapped into a certain demographic in the beginning. And they are urban, obsessed with Right, the show. but it was, it, we had Stephen King and Anne Rice both touted on Twitter and that, then you're like, oh wow, that's cool. Then so, Entertainment uh, Weekly is paying attention to it, and yeah, people else. are paying attention to it, and uh, it, it's uh, it it's cool. It's doing, you know, look, you know how it is. The ratings. It's not like when Falcon Crest came out. It was like a twenty five. I love that you picked Falcon. I always Crest. remember Falcon Crest, or like you know uh, the, the Fall Guy. Yeah, those were there was five shows on television. <laughs> now to get a like a hey, we got a one point one. It's a hit. Yep. You're gonna get picked up, and you're like, yeah, I cannot believe that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember in Mad in the height of Mad Men, I met someone at AMC, and they said, "If we get a million viewers, we're thrilled." And I thought, "This is the show that everyone's talking about." And if you get a million, it's amazing because you would think, "Wow, you should get a lot more than that." It's time for Ask uh, Kevin. This is a segment on the show where you get to literally ask me anything, mm. and I have to answer honestly. Oh, I have a good question for you. Okay. Do you think you were married before? Yes. Okay. And now your life is different from that marriage. Like a different lifetime. And uh, do you think you do you think your asshole qualities from your last life has diminished from your new life? I mean, I only knew you from your new life. I didn't know you from your last life. So email KPC. No, <laughs> no. But is do you think? I mean, to be honest with yourself, like uh, how I was twenty years yeah, ago. Yeah, because you know. How were you twenty? Were you how different are you twenty years ago than in your new life now? Because it's mm. drastically different, mm-hmm. and you, you don't really talk that much about your previous life. Your previous life, I've I've heard some things about it, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, you guys used to live in the Bird Streets, and you split, and now you have you 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 know you met Jamie, and it's uh-huh. like a completely different yeah. life, right? Yeah. Like- how different do you think? How different is your empathy? Mm. Uh, how how much has that changed? That two. A, a too big of a span of a question, or is that... It might be. I'll try to zero in on aspects of it. So um, I I think... Well, first of all, I know I'm happier now. Mm-hmm. Um, people who knew me then have commented on it enough so that I believe they must know what they're talking about. They say, wow, Kevin, you're not an asshole anymore. Like, <laughs> well, well, I don't seem, know... You I seem don't, less stressed. I <laughs> stressed? I, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting because my my um, some of my best qualities, I would say, uh, were enforced or reinforced by my ex-wife in terms of being a good person and doing the right thing. Mm. So, uh, if anything, I'm more of an asshole now than I was then. Oh, which. <laughs> 
<laughs> which I would not say. I'm just I'm just sort of a big overview. I couldn't be more of an asshole now. Excuse me. I couldn't have been more of an asshole then because she was, uh, and I'm sure remains, um, from the South and, and, and just in terms of proper upbringing and really uh, a very uh, empathetic person to others. So that was probably instilled in me because I was in my mid to late 20s. Oh, wow. When we got together, 27, 28. So I think um, uh, the man I became, we were together 20 years. Yeah. So the man I became certainly was under her watch, right? Because a man doesn't really grow up until he gets into his 30s, I don't believe. And that took place under her watch. Um, And I also think what empowered me to leave that life was a friend of mine pointed out, uh, the overview of my unhappiness saying, are you really going to live for her happiness the rest of your life? Because that's what was happening for about five. Like I woke up, epiphany, this is over. I can't do this. I'm not happy with any any of this. Um, and then five years later, I left. So it took me five years after making a decision to because I didn't want to crush one of the nicest people I've ever known. Mm. That's literally what. So uh, the asshole gene was, I want to say, was never there, has never been there because I was so also raised to care about other people. The asshole gene comes out in terms of my occasional lack of patience, right? So Jamie and I talk a lot about how we're both very aware of our surroundings, right? Um just in a in a crowded space, let's say. And we're always a little perturbed and then a lot perturbed by people who have no self-awareness in a public place. So it's little things like that 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 will f- will bring out the assholiness in me. But it, it, so that's part of the question. And then um, I will a- agree with the notion that I am a, uh, I want to say, 78, conservatively, 78% uh, different person than I was in that lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would just have to put together a list for you and in what ways. Uh, but the asshole empathetic part didn't, it, it was kind of instilled. And it's one of the reasons that I, I do look back on that life so fondly and so um, ap- appreciative. Um that I'm sure was the kind of answer you were hoping for, as opposed to a funny one. Oh no, that no, it's <laughs> no, it's interesting because I only I, I I'm not saying you're an asshole. I just <laughs> oh, I think that was clear. <laughs> I've heard some things, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Should we tell people how we met? Did we do that last time? We must have, but it was so long oh ago. God, I was you one, know I was your, I was a guest with Elon Musk. Yes, remember? yes. We all sat in Elon Musk's uh, little. It was a roadster. Oh, I keep saying little. Is well, that his, car was his little. original roadster. The original. Uh, he, I was a Tesla guest. I was a guest. Was a in, two-seater. Yeah, he was the guest first, and then then yeah. me. We used to do two in a day. Yeah, yeah. So, so he, I was like the test. We were like the like fourth the, or fifth show. Fourth, fifth show, like yeah. a billion years ago. Before nine I had kids. No, years I did ago. have a kid. It was nine years ago. No, nope, nine no, years. I didn't ago. have a kid. No, jeez. Yeah. Wow. Nine years. That's insane. This month, March, we're nine years old. That's amazing. You know, finally bring me back. Well. I felt long enough time had passed. Wow, you're like I don't. We'd have, have some new today. things to what, talk are about. Are you in town? <laughs> um, yeah, we met. Well, we met uh, doing a mini series. We met doing a mini series, a great mini series. How would people find it? Do you think? Oh man, that's, when people find that, it's a pretty phenomenal mini series on Sci-Fi called The Lost Room, three part mini series. You're with the main guy. In Was it. it three or four? Three, three parts. Three part. Yeah, and you can get the DVD. We yeah. shot in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I met you there. And uh, we both talked about. Uh, Poker and a fondness for younger women. Yeah, because I had dated a girl that was a poker player and probably the same age as Jamie. Cause she's 35 now. Jamie just turned 36. And I'm, I mean, I'm married now, so it's a totally different life. But we, yeah, we talked about that and and you were very friendly. The opposite <laughs> of asshole. <laughs> Yeah, and the, and we and then we had came a very to New York because I was living in New York, and you came to New York, and we saw you at screenings, and then yeah, I always saw you and Jamie, and then yeah. and then finally when I. Uh, would come to LA. I think. Uh, I think that's eventually. I was uh, on your talk show. What yeah. year do we think the Lost Room was made? It was two thousand. Let's see, because I was. That was about two. It was two thousand. No, no, no. Way after that. Oh. Two thousand. About two thousand eight. 
Okay, ten yeah. years. That was a great show. Coming up on really ten cool. years. Are you ready for Kevin's pop quiz as yes. we wind things up and let yep. Sam get back to his life? Mm -hmm. What a wonderful Sam's engineer! Like Jesus. Um, Kevin's pop quiz between five and fifteen points possible for each of the following three questions. Once the final score is tabulated, it will be posted on our website along with the current standing among the top one hundred. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Question number one: Dave Keckner or Rob Riggle? Keckner. Correct. Question number two, Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Weather in Carlsbad. Also true. And question three, <laughs> Keith? Nope. That's correct. <laughs> no one has gotten that right. You're the first person to get it correct. Wow, I had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> well, no. People think I'm looking for a last name for some reason. Jesus. When I just say Keith, I gave them two this or that. Wow. It's so clear to oh. me. But no one else. Thank you for getting that correct. Thank you for asking. Uh, what will you do with your Saturday night? I'll probably go get some salmon at Whole Foods. <laughs> what will you do with it? I'll call Greg Cromer and we'll have a party. <laughs> uh, I'll probably just put the kids to sleep with my wife and then we try to attempt to watch something and we both fall asleep by 9.15. That's right. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for carving out uh, a couple hours on your Saturday. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm always, it's always enjoyable. And Sam? Best, right? He's the best. There's only a couple of them, but I keep saying it. Whatever they're paying Sam is nowhere near enough. <laughs> he told me how to get to the bathroom, and I brought the keys, the public keys back uh, wrapped in a towel so I didn't get the <laughs> pee and urine on it. That right? was very thoughtful. Yeah, I was the first person I've seen do that. See? And I'm guessing the last. It's my Christian upbringings that I That's gotta be no it. longer believe in. <laughs> Uh, have a great Easter. Thank you. Sorry we killed your dude, but again, part of the God's plan. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And um, I'll it, and I'm looking forward to watching Maisel. <laughs> I'm like, good luck to you shooting that. Yeah. When does Claus return to the Claus to the will airways? return, I think, in June of this year. Ten Fent. episodes. Okay. And we're halfway shooting. Uh, Look for right Claus now. on the TNT in June. Yep. Season two. Yep. And you can follow me. Yes. At, how? At Jason Antoon on Twitter. And Instagram. And Instagram. Excellent. Yep. All right. I want to thank uh, Sam, uh, the best engineer ever. I want to thank Corey Levin, our post uh, producer. And uh, sorry, Sammy Levine and Jamie Fox were not with us today. Uh, they both have lives. Uh, or they both said, oh, Antoon is the guest. No, I don't need to. No. Sam uh, Levine is gearing up for his 36th birthday I uh, believe on well, it's Monday or Wednesday. No, I can't go to it. No, that's no. tonight. Yeah, you refuse to go tonight. Is no, that what tonight, you're saying? No, tonight's your thing. I thought. <laughs> no, tonight is Sam Levine's birthday party. Oh, tonight? Yeah, no, I can't. I can never go to. Sam's. <laughs> it's at a bar. I get invited deep to him in the and valley. He makes the same joke on the thing, which is like, I'm turning 50. I mean, it's always the same thing with Sam. <laughs> yes, like, God damn it, with two M's. <laughs> All right, until next time, and as always, get out of my face.